Hello and welcome to Nanobyte. Today we are going to learn about protected mode, what it is, how it works and how to make the switch. To understand the context of why all of these modes exist, let's take a brief look at the history of the x86 platform. The processor that started it all was the Intel 8086, a 16-bit processor launched in 1978. At the time, the market was dominated by 8-bit chips, such as the MOS 6502 that was used in the Apple II or the Commodore 64 and many other popular home computers, or the Zilog Z80 used in computers such as the TRS-80 or the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Its main 16-bit competitor was the Motorola 68000, which would later be used in the Apple Macintosh. What made the 8086 processor so popular was the inclusion of its cheaper brother, the Intel 8088, inside the original IBM PC, launched in 1981. Even though the Motorola 68000 was better designed, the Intel processor was cheaper, required fewer support chips, and it had better software and hardware adoption. And this is the reason why it was chosen. The IBM PC was one of the most important computers ever released. It came at a time when the personal computer market was seen as somewhat of a hobbyist market, with most computers being made by smaller companies like Apple, Commodore and Tandy. IBM was the biggest player in the computing industry, and they built and supplied big mainframes and computing machines for businesses. They had a huge influence in the business, and when they launched their first ever personal computer, the IBM PC, they basically legitimized microcomputers as serious machines that you could run your business on. Additionally, unlike their competition, this machine had an open architecture, meaning that they used off-the-shelf parts rather than proprietary hardware. This allowed competitors to quickly reverse engineer the machine and create a clone market. Another factor that contributed to its success was the quick launch of its killer app, Lotus123, a spreadsheet software that was widely adopted by businesses. All of these factors contributed to the IBM PC's explosion in popularity, and it became the base on which almost every personal computer was built. Even modern computers have some of the IBM PC's DNA in them. The 8086 had 20 address lines, meaning that it could access up to 1 megabyte of memory. This was considered huge at the time, which is why Intel didn't add more address lines, and also to keep costs down. Unfortunately, this resulted in this awful segment and offset scheme that we have to deal with. The operating system that came with the IBM PC or the IBM PC compatibles at the time was either MS-DOS or some other variant of DOS. They had some very serious limitations. They could only run one program at a time. The programs had absolute control of the system while they ran. The processor didn't offer any mechanism that the operating system could use in order to protect itself. There were many attempts to create multitasking operating systems on the 8086, even Windows 3.0 supported the 8086 processor, however, because of the lack of any protection features, programs could easily overwrite the memory used by the operating system or by other programs, so misbehaving programs would frequently make the entire system crash. The 1 megabyte limit also started to become problematic. So, just a year after the IBM PC was launched, in 1982, Intel launched a new CPU, the 286. They didn't really expect this processor to be used in personal computers, as it was designed for multi-user, multitasking and real-time applications. However, because it had a huge performance increase and it was compatible with the 8086, it was quickly adopted by the PC manufacturers. In addition to increasing the performance and also increasing the amount of memory that could be accessed to 16 megabytes, uh, this processor also introduced a new mode of operation, 16-bit protected mode. 
This was great and some operating systems took advantage of this mode of operation, however it had some very serious flaws. You could not switch back to real mode. And also, all the protection features added overhead that made the processor run slower. And many programs that were written for real mode did not run properly in this new protected mode, since most software on the market at the time was written for real mode, the 286 protected mode never really took off and most people avoided using it. Seeing all of these problems, Intel went back to their drawing board and in 1985 they launched one of its most important processors, the 386. This was their first true 32-bit processor and it also introduced the 32-bit protected mode that is still in use today. Unlike its predecessor, the 286, this processor allowed switching back to real mode. And it also introduced a new virtual 8086 operating mode, which allows running real mode applications in a virtual machine-like environment without actually exiting protected mode. An issue Intel has foreseen pretty early on was the 4GB limit imposed by the 32-bit architecture. Intel introduced a feature that partially solved the issue, physical address extensions. This was introduced in the Pentium Pro CPUs and it allowed the use of more than 4GB of RAM. Of course, at the time memory was very expensive and most computers came with maybe less than 100 megabytes of memory, but the addition of this feature shows that Intel was thinking ahead. While this feature allowed more than 4 gigs of RAM to be installed and managed by the operating system, single programs were still limited to 4 gigabytes of virtual memory. Thinking ahead, Intel designed a whole new CPU architecture, the Intel Itanium which was 64-bit from the start and tried to address many of the shortcomings of the x86 architecture. Unfortunately, it also had some very big flaws, like being very difficult to write compilers that can take advantage of the architecture, the lacking performance and of course the lack of backwards compatibility. As history repeatedly shows, backwards compatibility is very important. No matter how well designed your CPU is or how revolutionary it is, if it cannot run the software that people need to use, its usefulness is limited. The company that finally introduced 64-bit to the masses was Intel's main rival, AMD. With the introduction of the AMD Athlon 64 and Aptron CPUs back in 2003. Unlike Intel's revolutionary approach, AMD decided to use a more conservative design. By simply extending the existing 32-bit protected mode to 64 bits and then uh, allowing 32-bit programs to run in a compatibility mode, just like before. As modern computers can attest, this has been a huge success. And most computers today use the same 64-bit protected mode, which is also known as long mode. Today, CPUs have gotten a lot more features, like multiple cores, hardware-assisted virtualization, and many security improvements, but the core architecture has basically remained the same. So what is this protected mode exactly and why do we need it? What does it actually protect? In the real mode that we have used until now, all memory access and all hardware operations are completely unrestricted. What this means is that any running program can basically access any physical memory they want, even the one that's used by the operating system or by other programs. In addition to being a huge security risk, this also means that misbehaving programs can bring down the entire system. Protected mode enables several mechanisms through which the operating system can control what programs are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do. The first mechanism is privilege levels. The x86 processor has several privilege levels where code can execute, and these are called rings. Ring 0 is the most privileged level, and this is where the kernel typically resides. This level offers unlimited access to basically all the system resources and hardware. Ring 3 is the most unprivileged level, and this is where the user land programs usually reside. When a program wants to access a restricted resource, such as more memory or access to some hardware, it has to request that resource from the kernel, and the kernel can decide whether to grant the request or to deny it. There are also rings 1 and 2, which are sometimes used for device drivers or privileged user land programs, however, most operating systems, including Windows and Linux, 
don't actually use these two. They only use Ring 0 for the kernel mode and the Ring 3 for user mode. Switching from a privilege level to another is not done arbitrarily. For a program to call the kernel to do something, it has to perform a system call. This will switch the processor into Ring 0 and it will start handling that system call. When that system call finishes executing, the CPU will make the switch back to Ring 3 and will continue executing the user land program. Interrupts will also make the CPU switch to Ring 0 so that it can handle that interrupt. For example, when a keyboard key is pressed or the mouse is moved. Interrupts are actually one of the most commonly used mechanisms to perform system calls. Another protected mode feature is segmentation. In real mode, we used segments to access basically different memory banks of memory. In protected mode, segments actually serve a very different purpose. Segments are now defined in a special table called the global descriptor table, where each entry can define a memory region and all the various privileges that are assigned to that memory region. For example, we can control what privilege level is required to access that piece of memory, we can control whether it's a code segment or a data segment. However, this mechanism is somewhat deprecated and most operating systems don't actually use it anymore. The global descriptor table is now only filled with the minimum amount of entries to make it possible to make the switch to protected mode and use a flat memory model. In 64-bit long mode, this is actually not supported at all. Finally, we are going to talk about paging. This is one of the most important protection features because it allows completely virtualizing the memory space. What this means is that the memory space that can be seen by a program or even by the kernel can be completely remapped by the kernel. Using this mechanism, each program can be mapped in such a way so that they don't actually share any physical memory. What this means is that programs can be completely isolated from each other. Another use for paging is to allow swapping. If the system is low on physical memory, the operating system can decide to store some memory pages that are less frequently used to the disk and then freeing up some more memory for other programs. We will discuss all of these protection mechanisms at length when we get to use them. So we got all of these cool protection features, in addition to the ability to use more than one megabyte of memory. Isn't that awesome? Yes, it is very awesome. However, there's a little trade-off here. In making this switch, we lose the ability to call BIOS interrupts that we relied on for reading the disk or printing text to the screen and so on. From now on, we have to write our own drivers. It's a bummer, isn't it? However, it's not so bad after all. The BIOS drivers aren't very good, uh, they are very limited and they offer just enough functionality to get the, an operating system to start up. Relying on these for the long term is a very bad idea. That's the reason why old versions of Windows were so unstable, especially versions prior to Windows 95. So in the long term, we definitely want to write our own drivers. Now that we have learned about protected mode and we know what it is, let's figure out the steps that we need to make the switch to protected mode. We will use two resources for this. Uh, the first one is the Intel menu, which has a nice checklist of things that need to be done for the switch. This can be found in Volume 3, the System Programming Guide, Chapter 9, Processor Management and Initialization, under the Mode Switching section. The second resource we will use is the OS Dev Wiki, which is a great place for learning the basics of making operating systems. Let's continue by building a minimal boot sector program that we can use for testing and debugging. I created a new main.asm file, set the origin to 7c00, which is where the boot sector is loaded by the BIOS, and told the assembler to emit 16-bit machine code. Then I added an infinite loop. At the end of the file, I added padding bytes, so our file becomes 510 bytes long, and then I declared the boot signature, AA55. This is required so that the BIOS actually boots our program and doesn't skip it. As part of the initialization procedure, I reset all the statement registers to zero and set up the stack just below where we are loaded. 
Now let's quickly build a makefile to assemble this file and generate the floppy image. We don't need the file system, so it's enough to simply extend the binary file built by NASM to 1.44 MB using the truncate command. I also added phony targets for running with camo and debugging with box. I copied the box config file from the Nanobyte OS repository, I'll put a link in the description. Now that we have everything ready, let's switch to protected mode. The first step in the Intel manual is to disable interrupts. This is easy, we simply have to use the CLI instruction. Interrupts are basically some functions that are called automatically by the processors when certain events happen. We've used the BIOS interrupts before to interact with various hardware using the INT instruction. This is just one of the ways in which interrupts can be triggered. Certain hardware components can also trigger interrupts, for example the system timer generates periodic interrupts at a steady interval, the keyboard will trigger interrupt whenever we press a key, the disk controller will trigger an interrupt when the disk finishes reading, the BIOS has set up its own interrupt handler so that it can deal with these events until the operating system takes over. Because we are performing some very critical operations, we cannot allow the processor to be interrupted. The Intel manual also mentions disabling NMI or non-maskable interrupts. These normally occur in two cases, a hardware failure or the watchdog timer, which is a feature that can be enabled by the operating system to automatically reset the system if the kernel locks up. The OS Dev Wiki shows a way in which these interrupts can be enabled and disabled, however in all the places that I looked at, including the Grob legacy bootloader, this is not actually done. The watchdog isn't enabled by default, so only hardware failures can trigger NMI interrupts at this stage. Since the mode switch happens so fast, it is pretty unlikely that these errors occur exactly when the CPU is changing modes. So this is why I opted not to do it either. I don't know whether this is the most correct decision or not, but this is what I chose to do. Step number two is to enable the 820 gate. This is only mentioned on the OS Dev Wiki. The 820 gate is a historical relic from the original 8086 processor which only had 20 address bits, numbered from 0 to 19. When attempting to access memory above that 20 bit limit, it would wrap around to the beginning. Some software actually relied on this behavior, so in order to maintain backwards compatibility, this hack was introduced on later machines where the 20th address line was forced to a zero by default. This way the wrapping around behavior could still be reproduced, but the side effect is that we cannot access the odd megabytes of memory. In order to disable this hack we have to talk to, you guessed it, the keyboard controller. Because now it would be a good time to talk about I.O. ports. This is the main way of talking to hardware on the x86 platform. Each piece of hardware is assigned one or more of these ports. Some people may actually remember the mess that these ports created back in the 80s and 90s, when hardware came with predefined ports and combining certain components would result in port conflicts. Some cards even included physical jumpers or dip switches that could be used to change the port so that they avoid these conflicts. The problem was resolved when Microsoft introduced the plug and play specification, which applied to the ISA expansion cards, however modern computers use PCI instead of ISA, which also has a dynamic port assignment mechanism. So how can we actually use these ports? There are two instructions for that, the out and in instructions, these can be used to send data to and from the hardware. The PS2 keyboard controller is one of the few remaining devices that actually have pre-assigned ports. Port 64 hexadecimal can be used to write to the command register or to read from the status register. 
port 60 is used to send or receive data from the keyboard controller. Let's define some constants for this port so we don't need to use magic numbers. The way we communicate with this controller chip is that we have to send a command through the command port and any parameters or results are written or read from the data port. This chip is pretty slow in comparison to the super fast CPU, so we have to do a lot of waiting until the chip manages to finish executing the previous command. We can tell when the chip is finished by checking the status register. When bit 1 is cleared, that means that the controller has finished to process our command, and when bit 0 is set, that means that the chip has some data for us. Let's also create some constants for the commands that we will need to send to the chip. And we will use four commands, AD and AE are used to disable and enable the keyboard, and D0 and D1 are used to read and write from the controller output port. This sounds a bit confusing, but this controller output port refers to reading and writing some pins on the actual keyboard controller, not an I.O. port. In order to enable the A20 gate, what we have to do is first disable the keyboard. This is to prevent any interruption of our command sequence. Of course, this operation is surrounded by a lot of waiting for the controller to be ready for commands. Next, we read the value of the controller output port. This is done by first sending the read command, waiting for the data to arrive and then reading the value. All we want to do now is to set the A20 gate bit to enabled, that would be bit 1. And then we write this value back to the controller output port. Finally, we re-enable the keyboard and we are done. Something to consider here is that the 820 gate may already be enabled, so it might be a good idea to check if this is the case. This can be done by writing some magic numbers to a very low address like 500 in hexadecimal, which is the lowest address that is free to use and then checking if it wraps around, meaning that the address 100500 contains the magic numbers. This would correspond to real mode address FFFF0510. On the OS Dev Wiki, a similar technique is described by comparing the boot sector signature and then changing it and verifying again to make sure that something like this doesn't happen by pure chance. Now that this is done, step number 3 is to set up the global descriptor table. This is related to the segmentation feature that we talked a bit about earlier. In protected mode, segments are no longer used to access different memory banks, as it was the case in real mode, but to section memory into different parts that serve different purposes and have different access levels. The way we define these sections is through the global descriptor table, which, as you guessed it, is a table that contains a couple of fields. Each entry is exactly 8 bytes long, and it follows this exact structure. The encoding looks a bit messy because it was done with legacy support in mind, and the 386 processor was built upon what the 286 already had, so they basically had to use every single unused bit. The base specifies the physical address where the segment starts and the limit is basically the length of the segment. If we want a flat memory model, we just set the base to 0 and the limit to the highest possible number, FFFF, FFFF, 
Since the engineers didn't find enough free bits to fit a 32-bit limit, they added a granularity bit, which can be toggled to specify either 1 byte blocks or 4 kilobyte blocks. So instead of 8 Fs, we used the maximum limit of FFFFF and the granularity set to 4 kilobyte blocks. Now let's define the GDT ourselves. The first entry must always be 0, so we just use DQ0 to define it. Next we will define a data segment. We want to simply use the flat memory model, so we set the base to 0 and the limit to FFFFF. For the flags we have present 1, ring 0, so 0, 0, a code or data segment, 1, executable 1, direction 0, readable 1, and access is 0. Granularity is 4 kilobyte blocks, so a 1, and 32-bit protected mode 1. The next two bits are reserved, so we set them to 0, and the upper bits of the limit are 1, 1, 1, 1. The upper byte of the base is also 0. The data segment looks almost identical, so we can just copy this entry and all we have to change is the executable bit and set it to 0. Now we also want to be able to switch back to real mode, so we will need to define some 16-bit entries as well, since we have to pass through 16-bit protected mode. Again, I will copy the 32-bit code segment entry and then I will change the granularity to 1 byte so 0, and the size bit to 0. The same changes are needed for the data segment. To load this descriptor table, we need to define another structure, which is called the GDT descriptor. This contains two fields, the size of the GDT in bytes minus 1, and the memory offset where the GDT is located. Now we can load the GDT, which is done using a special CPU instruction, LGDT, which will take as the parameter the descriptor structure we just created. That's basically all, so we can return from this function. We've basically completed all the preparation steps, so now we can make the switch. This is done by modifying the control register 0. This is a very special register that can be used to enable or disable certain CPU features. We don't want to change anything unintended, so we first read its value, set the protected mode enable bit, which is bit 0, and then copy the value back to CR0. We are almost there. The final step is to perform a far jump into a protected mode code segment. In our case, the code segment is the second entry into the global descriptor table, which is at offset 8 and we can use a label to mark where protected mode code starts. From now on we are in 32-bit protected mode. We can actually verify that using box. As you can see, when we start box it tells us that the CPU is in 16-bit real mode. If we press continue and then break, we will see that the current instruction is this infinite loop and in the status bar box is telling us that we are in 32-bit protected mode. Some things will now be different. All values pushed to the stack must be at least 32 bits wide, we can no longer push 16-bit things, the return addresses of function calls will also be 32 bits wide, and we no longer need to use the segmented offset scheme. If we want to access address 1234567, we just use the address 1234567. This is called the flat memory model and this is what we configured in the global descriptor table. At this point we have to tell the assembler to emit 32-bit code, which is done using the bits32 directive. Actually, let's try and see what happens if we forget. I added two simple instructions to move 10 to AX and 20 hex to BX. Now I will make and make debug, then I'll go into view, disassemble, the address we want to look at is 7C00 and 512 lines is fine. 
We can't see our code yet because it hasn't been loaded, but we can set breakpoints. So let's double click on the first instruction to create a breakpoint and then continue. It looks like the debugger hit our breakpoint. To see our code, all we have to do is run disassemble again. What I want to show you is right after this jump instruction when switching to protected mode. So I set the breakpoint and continued. And now I will go one step forward. At this point we should be seeing two move instructions, but we are seeing something else. We do have a move, but the value it's writing is completely wrong and the next instructions look completely messed up. What's happening here is that the processor expects 32-bit instructions and it's interpreting whatever bytes are there as 32-bit instructions. Obviously, this won't work, so let's add the bits32 directive. Now, the assembler isn't that smart. When it encounters a bits directive, all the code that follows will be changed, but all the functions we have below, enable A20 and low GDT, are meant to be run from real mode, so let's add the bits directive to every function. Rerunning this again, the move instructions now look correct. Let's try something else. Let's try to print some text to the screen. All we have to do is put 0e hexadecimal in AH, the character in AL and then call interrupt 10 hexadecimal, right? Let's see what happens. I don't want to debug, so I'll just press continue. And it looks like the debugger stopped somewhere in the BIOS code. Let's check the console and see if there's anything interesting there. And what is this? A third exception with no resolution and then a reset. This right here is called a triple fault and it happens when the processor encounters an error and then a second error while trying to handle the first error and then a third error while trying to handle the second error. When this happens, this means that something has gone terribly wrong and rather than continuing in this broken state, the processor resets. And this is why we can no longer use the BIOS interrupts while in protected mode. Fortunately, this is something that's very easy to do in the default video mode that the BIOS set up. But before doing that, let's finish the rest of the steps. It looks like the next one on our list is step 6. We haven't enabled paging and don't plan to just yet, so we can skip this step. We can also skip 7 and 8 because we aren't using the local descriptor table and also we are not setting up tasking yet. Step 9 tells us to set up the segment registers, so let's do that right now. This time we will use the 32-bit protected mode data segment entry from the descriptor table, which would be the third entry, so it is at offset 16 or 10 hexadecimal. We don't have any plans to use the ES, FS and GS registers, so we can just leave them to zero. We will also skip steps 10 and 11. We aren't setting up the interrupt descriptor table yet, we will do that in a future video. Now that we are done, let's see how we can print some text. A long time ago, IBM released the IBM PS2 computer, which contained a graphics controller called VGA. While a lot of things have changed since then, almost all video cards made in the last 30 years have remained compatible with this VGA controller. This way, any operating system can offer some basic graphics capabilities, even if they don't have the proper drivers. This is how we will display text to the screen, by using this VGA interface. The BIOS, being very nice to us, has placed the video controller into this 80x24 character 16 color text mode. If you remember from some older video when I showed this memory map of the lower memory, there was this region between A0000 and C0000 which was mapped to the video card. In the text mode we are currently using, the range starting from the address B8000 is mapped directly to the characters that you see on the screen. So all we have to do in order to print text is to write our characters directly to this memory area. So I defined a constant for this B8000 address and I also added a hello world string terminated with a zero. To print this string, let's load the address of the string into 
SI and the video memory address in DI. I also cleared the direction flag so that the load SP instruction goes upwards. Actually, since we are now in protected mode, we should use the 32-bit registers ESI and EDI instead. Inside the main loop, I first called load SB, which loads a byte from the memory referenced by ESI into the AL register and increments ESI. Next, I added the loop exit condition. If the character in AL is 0, we jump outside the loop to the done label. Then we copy the character from AL into the memory referenced by EDI and we increment EDI twice. We will see why in just a moment. Finally, we jump to the loop label. Let's run this and see if it works. And here you go. On the first line, the characters have been replaced with the hello world string. So why did I increment EDI twice? That's because the second byte defines the color of the character. Let's play with this and set the second byte to 2. The assembler doesn't know what the size of 2 is, so we need to specify that it's a byte. I'll run this, and now Hello World is written in green. Cool, right? The color byte actually contains two colors, a background color and a foreground color. To set the background, we have to use the upper half of this byte. If I set the color to 47 hexadecimal, the text is now gray with a red background. I tried another combination, 2A, which results in light green text with a darker green background. Let's have some more fun with colors and change them for each character. And now we have Hello World written in all the colors. Cool, right? Let's have even more fun and try to switch back to real mode. Why would we want to do such a thing? Remember that in 32-bit protected mode we cannot use the BIOS interrupts. So, a simple workaround, at least until we can load our own drivers, is to switch back to real mode, call the BIOS interrupt and then go back to protected mode. Again, the Intel manual has a checklist that we can use. The first step is to disable interrupts, we haven't actually enabled them, so we can move on. Step number 2 talks about disabling paging, we haven't enabled paging at all, so moving on to step 3. At this point, we have to make a jump to a 16-bit code segment. We already have this set up in our global descriptor table, so let's do exactly that. The 16-bit code segment is the fourth entry, which means offset 24 or 18 in hexadecimal. At this point, we are no longer in 32-bit protected mode, but we are in 16-bit protected mode. Let's tell that to the assembler. Step number 4 tells us to load the segment registers with the 16-bit data segment. I skipped this step because we don't need to access any memory or stack until we reach real mode. But if you need to do that, for example to load an interrupt descriptor table, then you need to set up the data and stack segments as well. Step number 5 tells us to load the interrupt descriptor table. Again, we haven't changed it, so the bias one is still loaded. In step 6, we have to unset the protected bit from the control register 0, so let's do that. To unset a bit, we perform an AND operation with the negated bit, which means that all the other bits are 1 and the bit we want to unset is 0. We are almost there, the next step is to jump to real mode. And finally, we configure the segment registers and then we can enable the interrupts. We can test if the interrupts work by printing the hello world text, but this time using the BIOS interrupt. And here we go. We have now printed Hello World from both, protected mode and real mode. What's interesting is that the BIOS has remembered the old cursor position. Let's make things a bit more interesting and write separate Hello World messages from protected and real modes. <laughs> 
If we now want to switch back to protected mode, all we need to do is repeat the steps above except for the A20 gate, which is already enabled, so we don't need to enable it again, and the global descriptor table, which is still loaded. And we are finally at the end. This is great. Today we have learned a lot of new interesting things about the x86 architecture and we have mastered switching from 16-bit real mode to protected mode and back. Thank you a lot for your attention. If you have any questions or you want to join our Discord community, the link is in the description below. See you next time. Bye bye.